This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the course of the hour, we'll run through all the business news stories you need to know about from Africa and beyond. But first, a quick run through the markets for you. Now, South African equities essentially close a week 4% higher. This is the best week, according to Bloomberg data, uh, since the month of June. Nigeria, in comparison, relatively unchanged. And Kenya, of course, up by about one percentage point. At this point in time, US equities are mostly in the red. Dow Jones down about half a percentage point, S&P 500 down seven tenths and the Nasdaq composite down one and a quarter of a percent. Uh, Tesla bulls, for those of you who are keeping a close eye on that particular stock, down by at least one and a half percent. But on a year to date basis, it's still over 300 percent higher. So if you're looking for a correction, this certainly isn't it. Here's what's coming up tonight. Kenya's economy is expected to rebound and grow by over five percent in 2021. Sudan declares an economic emergency after the collapse of its currency. And the UK bags its first trade deal post-Brexit with Japan. Right, and let's start the hour, though, with some news that we're following at the moment. Israel and the Gulf state of Bahrain are reported to have reached a landmark deal to fully normalize their ties. That's according to US President Donald Trump on his preferred medium of Twitter, in the last hour. Now, for decades, most Arab states have essentially boycotted the state of Israel. They've insisted they will only establish formal ties after the Palestinian dispute is definitively settled. But just last month, the United Arab Emirates agreed to normalize ties with the state of Israel. There has been much speculation that Bahrain might follow suit. The Gulf state is now the fourth Arab country in the Middle East to recognize Israel since its founding in 1948. The others include Egypt and Jordan. Israel and Bahrain, of course, as you just mentioned there, have agreed to fully normalize their ties. Now, let's get back to the continent. Kenya's economy is expected to grow by less than 2.5% this year, down from last year's figure of 5.4%. And that's mainly due to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. According to the country's finance ministry, the economy is pretty resilient uh, in the first quarter of 2020. Growth in that particular period was 4.9 percent, compared to 5.5 percent in the same quarter the year before. The East African nation's GDP is forecast to expand by 5.3 percent in 2021 and 5 percent the year after. Kenya is currently in talks with the World Bank for a loan to provide further budgetary support. It did receive at least a billion dollars to that end in May, and that in turn followed a $750 million package approved in 2019. The budget deficit, however, is set to rise to $7.8 billion in the current fiscal year. That's equivalent to roughly 7.5% of GDP. Now, still in Kenya, East Africa's biggest capital market still continues a five-year drought of fresh listings, with the benchmark in the C20 having fallen by nearly 30% so far in 2020. It did hit several multi-year lows along the way. Trading volumes did hit levels not seen in over two years in the month of July, with the best-performing counter so far being the Absa New Gold ETF. Now, the boss is working on bringing two more exchange-traded funds to the market amidst a dearth of fresh listings in East Africa's largest capital market. Kenya's last IPO was back in 2016 when the apparel retailer Deacons listed. Despite repeated promises to do so, however, Kenya's government hasn't really privatized any more state-owned entities or sold down its equity stakes in listed firms. Now, earlier on, I spoke to the CEO of the NSC. I started by asking him how the boss is approaching potential business in Ethiopia, as that country is implementing the partial privatization of companies like Ethio Telcom. Ethiopia is one market that uh, we've been collaborating very, very well with. Um, we've had discussions with the Ethiopian uh, National Bank and also the Ethiopian Commodity Exchange. And so we are starting to get familiar with a lot of issues that they're facing. Um, our, our plan there is to provide technical support from the outgo. Uh, because we believe we've played a role in helping mark capital mark markets in East and East Africa develop, and hence we want, want to provide that technical support. We have signed an MOU with them, and we are, we are in that discussion. Uh, we believe that in the long term, 
uh, Kenya will provide a very ideal uh, market for companies from Ethiopia to cross-list or dual-list because we have depth of market, we have more liquidity here. Uh, but we believe the journey, the way to start it off, is to provide them with technical support and help them develop their own market upon which we'll then be able to have better collaborations. When you talk about technical support, does that extend to taking an equity position in the stock market that they will eventually set up? At this stage, it's a bit premature to anticipate any uh, direct equity interest. Uh, but uh, what part of our strategy in East and Central Africa is to East Africa rather is to invest in in uh, similar institutions. We took a position in the Dar es Salaam Stock Exchange, and uh, we are working closely with them. And so when, when approached, we are keen to do that. But the decision that we, we would not like to say is top on our list at the moment. I think it's really, first of all, work on collaborations, MOUs, and various other things to help establish the market first. Given the, 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 the low yields that we're seeing, at least in the, in the government bond market, if I'm just using T-bills here as a proxy, because we've seen the 364 day note, for example, fall from uh, at least 10% all the way down to almost 7-8%. Uh, is that essentially driving more people back into the equities market, at least over the short term in 2020? Yeah, certainly. Uh, if you, for instance, compare uh, the yields that people are getting on the on the on the on the equity markets, for instance, uh, the dividend yields are pretty pretty competitive now. Uh, we're seeing companies' pro, uh, dividend yields ranging between seven to nine percent, which is uh, competing quite uh, favorably uh, with the uh, fixed income market. Notwithstanding the fact that um, there's a potential earnings from the capital gains as well. So I must say that uh, the declining yields of the fixed income market have also been an attributing factor. Uh, and also the multiples are extremely low. And so uh, when people uh, price in the normalcy after the COVID uh, situation, then uh, there's definitely a very strong upside. One of the uh, better performers in the market at the moment, at least so far this year, is a Barclays or essentially Absa now that they've rebranded, uh, the Absa New Gold uh, ETF, up about 35% so far this year, in contrast to a lot of the other elements uh, on the market. Um, are we planning to get any more ETFs into the market? Yes, uh, that is, um, Rama, that is one of our, our key goals this, this particular uh, strategic period. Uh, we're really focusing the next four years in terms of increasing uptake of products. And hence, the Barclays ETF has this year performed extremely well. Now, uh, this has really been our message to investors that the ETFs are a very low risk investment because of their, their very diversified nature. They are normally very, uh, what do you call it, uh, low cost assets uh, to, to invest in, and hence a very good uh, protector against uh, volatility. In, for instance, when it's like the commodity ETF uh, offered by Barclays, which is a gold ETF. Uh, without breaking any NDAs, can you give us an idea of what sort of ETFs are coming into the market, at least of the two that you've mentioned? What sort of underlying asset classes are they putting the money into? Well, we have a... Um, uh, an investor looking at, at the bond market and so maybe one around that asset class and one is also considering around our the, in one of the indices on the exchange so those two are currently the ones that we are we are considering at the moment uh, are there any timelines on when those negotiations might be complete and we have these products coming to market adding to that bouquet of assets that we have uh, on the NSE? Well, I think uh, most of them had an horizon of uh, this year, but uh, now looking at the way the COVID has played out, I think any time up to the first quarter of next year, we could expect to see them coming through uh, because we've lost a lot of time the, the last uh, four or five months, and hence uh, a lot of work had been put on hold and uh, projected. Maybe now uh, their 12-year their horizon probably ends in the, in the first quarter of next year. All right, and on to Sudan now. The authorities over there have declared an economic state of emergency after the country's currency fell pretty sharply. The transitional government over there, which is in charge of the country ever since the removal from power of Omar Hassan al-Bashir last year, will criminalize the purchasing, selling, possessing or smuggling of unrefined gold or precious minerals, key hard currency earners. For that particular state. Now, the Sudanese pound has declined pretty sharply in recent weeks, and what officials have blamed as manipulation by those who they say are opposed to the transitional government. The currency has been devalued four times since 2018. Headline inflation in Sudan is second only to that in Venezuela, with the headline rate climbing to about 144% in July.
Now, the annual African Green Revolution Forum has come to close in the Rwandan capital of Kigali, with 10,000 participants taking place, uh, taking part rather, online. President Paul Kagame, who hosted the event, called on his African counterparts to implement existing policies in order to fast-track a much-needed agrarian revolution. The 10th annual forum kicked off officially on the 8th of September, virtually, of course, in this day and age of uh, COVID-19. It's the first time in history that that is actually happening. Discussions focused on how best to move African agriculture forward. AGRF is the world's premier forum on African agriculture. It underscored the need to harness the power of Africa's young people to revitalize the sector. This year, the virtual forum came at an unprecedented time when some major African countries are facing a looming hunger crisis following the implementation of lockdown measures designed to contain the spread of COVID-19. Now then, let's assess the state of food supply chains on the continent with Dr. Agnes Kalibata. She's the president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution for in Africa, but in, of course, as AGR. Now, um, Dr. Kalibata, thank you for your time this evening. Um, this year's event, of course, did focus on food security in urban areas. Why did you choose to focus specifically on that issue? Thank you, and thank you for having me. This was recognizing that Africa has been, at least before COVID, was the fastest and still is the fastest urbanizing continent. Uh, by 2030, it is estimated that 52% of Africans will be living in, in uh, urban areas. So we really see an opportunity for us to link um, markets for farmers to, to the urban population. So in, as a result, we actually had a deal room at the AGRF, which attracted 197 businesses looking to invest and also attracted 400 businesses looking for capital. So what we are trying to do there was trying to meet too much the need for capital and the, the people that are looking to, to invest. So we, with this, we hope that we can really start showing the opportunities that African cities have and African cities can offer to growing Africa's rural areas and growing Africa's economies. Indeed. So give us a sense of what the continental picture is like at the moment, because we've got some country data here and there. But to what extent has this pandemic dislocated food supply chains and increased food insecurity on the continent? There's been a significant impact on food security in a number of areas. I, I mean, markets, of course, uh, uh, physical markets were disrupted. Uh, supply chains, of course, are, like you're saying, were disrupted. Uh, su supermarkets shut down uh, or slowed down. Transport was disrupted from cities to, to, village, to, to rural areas. But I think the biggest disruption has also been around movement from country to country uh, with, with, uh, with borders closing but also the slow movement of food from, from all sorts of the world as, as ports uh, slow down and, and, and in some cases shut down. So the major impact of that has been that, um, first of all, a number of people that are employed in that food sector ha has significantly reduced, so people have lost jobs. But secondly, the cost of food starts going up because, uh, again, um, there's, there isn't as much volume. When you need volume the most so that you can reduce the cost of food, actually volume started reducing because of the logistical issues associated with food. And from a farmer's perspective, a lot of food is, is wasting on the farms in countries where they are harvesting, like Mozambique, Malawi. Uh, so, so we also see all those challenges happening now. Indeed. One last question for you, Dr. Kalibata. Negotiations on the continental free trade area, they yet to be wrapped up before it comes into effect next year, hopefully on the 1st of January 2021. Are you seeing any indicators after this forum that countries are more willing to open up their food markets to each other within this EFTA? Or are you still seeing more of the same old protectionism that has plagued continental food markets for so long? Uh, the, the continent of uh, free trade area is quite advanced. The secretariat is in place. Today we're having conversations with the secretary general. It was supposed to start in July. It was moved because of COVID. It will start in January. So I have every reason to believe that African countries are committed to this uh, working. It's a huge market for Africa and it will work. I don't think Africa is protectionist because if Africa was protectionist, we would not be importing $80 billion worth of food that we are already 
producing that we have the capability to produce. So I don't, or even importing stuff that we can do away with, like plastics and stuff like that. So I really don't think Africa is protectionist. I think Africa could do with some little bit of, of thinking about what is it that we produce well that we can actually share among ourselves? But and we are trade protectionists among to each other, aren't we, Dr. Kalibata? I mean, if you look at the example of Kenya, for example, with its sugar market, year after year after year, it keeps protecting its sugar market, even though it has very inefficient producers, vis-a-vis uh, -vis other African producers like Uganda or Mauritius, it just keeps that sugar out of its market. Um, Nigeria, uh, this week, for example, has effectively tried to lock out um, any uh, rice imports or fertilizer imports, and that rice could just as easily be produced anywhere else on the African continent? So I'm not saying there's none. Uh, there's, going, there's a little bit of protectionism here and there. And that's why the, the, for, uh, the continental free trade area was created, so that we can work through these things. There are a number of challenges we have to work through. So those will have to be worked through. And I'm sure that people are committed to working through those. I'm just saying that, that we are not even anywhere near to what is protectionist in what I see in other parts of the world. Indeed. Thank you very much for your time this evening, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, President of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Time now for one. All right, and a quick run through some company headlines. Um, right, let's start with PayPal. It has extended its partnership with Visa. Instant transfer to service where PayPal lets users to quickly access transferred funds by moving them to bank accounts is expanding globally to both domestic and cross-border payments in international markets. Now, this essentially means that those that send or receive money by PayPal or Venmo or Zoom or Braintree, HyperWallet or iZattle Product Solutions will now be able to opt for the instant transfer option in order to get an electronic funds transfer done as fast as possible. The Kenyan low-cost carrier Jamajet has increased its domestic fares for five routes by at least 37% as passenger capacity rises from 30% to 58%. So those traveling from the capital to Kisumu out in the west, Mombasa, Eldoret and Malindi will now pay about $61 up from $44. Jamojet will also uh, is also planning rather to start flying between cities in Kenya without stopping at its harbor in Nairobi starting on the 2nd of October. In the meantime, beer distributors in Kenya have asked the Revenue Authority and the National Treasury to reconsider a proposal to increase tax on alcoholic beverages starting next month. Now, the distributors are warning that that tax hike will result in more losses at a time when there are more than 100,000 jobs in the sector which have been lost and about 400,000 livelihoods negatively affected. Kenya's entire alcoholic beverages industry has also lost over $350 million in the last five months. And finally, the CEO of Rio Tinto has resigned amid an investor backlash over the destruction of 46,000-year-old Aboriginal heritage sites in Australia. Jean-Sebastien Jacques has been the firm CEO since 2016. He will leave his role by the 31st of March next year, the latest, or earlier, if a success is found. Chris Salisbury, Iron Ore Unit CEO, and Simone Niven, Group Executive of Corporate Relations, will also be leaving the global miner. That's a run through your company headline. You're watching Global Business Africa. Time for a short break. Here's what's coming up next. Egypt's external debt rises to over $110 billion in 2020. And President Buhari orders a freeze on access to the FX market for food and fertilizer imports. We'll have the details next. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global Business Reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Okay. We'll Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market-moving decisions are made, who's responsible? 
and why. This is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. Welcome back to the program. Let's head over to North Africa. Egypt's external debt levels have risen to over $110 billion this year, and that's up from $48 billion back in 2015. Now, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, the country's central bank did suspend the collection of loan payments for a period of six months, starting in March and ending on the 15th of September. Effectively, that put a freeze on about $127 billion worth of loan payments. The CBE is yet to decide, though, whether it will suspend or rather extend that suspension period. Inflation in the country did reach its peak in the second quarter of 2017. At that point in time, it was at 33 percent, mainly as a result of the economic reforms that were started back in November 2016, including the full floating of the Egyptian pound. Egypt has attracted over $400 billion in global, from global markets and remittances from Egyptians abroad since President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi came into office. A further 260 international investment funds have bought up treasury bills and bonds in the North African economy. On to West Africa, the Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari has ordered the central bank to stop providing foreign exchange for food and fertilizer imports. That's part of ongoing efforts to boost local production and conserve scarce dollars in the market. Nigeria is struggling at the moment to close a trade gap which widened to a record $4.7 billion in three months through to June. This comes after the global crash in the price of oil, which is the country's main export, but also its key source of hard currency earnings. Prices fell by at least 47% in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, which effectively killed off most demand for the commodity. Inflows of the greenback into Africa's largest economy dried up due to that plunge in oil prices, and that in turn increased pressure on what little dollar reserves were available, and it forced the central bank to devalue the Naira slightly twice this year. Now, Kenya's decision to shut down schools, physically at least, until January 2021 because of the pandemic has left many private schools struggling to survive. At Roka Preparatory School in central Kenya, the sound of children in classrooms has now been replaced with that of clucking chickens. The playground is now a vegetable plot. James Kungo, who founded the school some 23 years ago, says he's had to turn to farming in order to survive. CGTN's Alexander Majala has that story. A few short months ago, these rows of spinach were a sports field where the students of Roka Preparatory School once played football. <coughs> where there were classrooms, now roam sawdust-covered clucking chickens. This private school is now a farm. No students have thundered down these really quiet corridors since March, when Kenya abruptly closed its schools three days after the first case of COVID-19 was detected. Corona came as a shock to everybody, me included. And uh, because it has stopped us from carrying on with our daily routines, teaching in the classrooms and uh, getting a revenue from the children. And uh, all at once we are told, home you go, and we went. Private schools have been harder hit. According to the Kenya Private School Association, the country's 11,400 private primary and secondary schools serve about 2.6 million students. They vary from bare classrooms charging a few thousand shillings a term to ultra-manicured campuses serving the nation's elite. KPSA adds that around 150 schools have already gone bust and most of the 158,000 teachers working in private schools are on unpaid leave. The loss of income means some private schools will shut permanently. I had to think how to use the classrooms because they were haunting most of the times. When you wake up in the morning, and uh, you hear the, the, the empty classes looking at you. It's an investment, very discouraging. And uh, quickly I thought of occupying the classrooms. And the idea that came first was to keep chicken in the classrooms. While some schools have been able to oversee distance learning, in others, the pupils and the teachers have no way to connect to the internet. This has driven some to look for creative ways to make money. But turning Rocker Preparatory into a farm doesn't solve all problems. 
The school has lost $184,500 in school fees this year from its 520 students while still paying partial salaries to teachers. Schools are expected to stay closed at least until January. Kenya's education ministry say they can only reopen when the number of COVID-19 cases drop substantially. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. From East Africa to the north, Tunisia's new tourism minister is warning that this pandemic could essentially wipe out gains made by the sector, not just in the last couple of years, in the last six decades. The North African nation has pledged to deploy whatever financial support is needed to revive an industry that employs close to half a million people. From Tunis, Pierre Sigitian's Adin Chwachi with that story. Tunisia's tourism ministry has unveiled a stimulus package to eight hotels and tourism players with funds to ride out the downturn caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The state will not abandon the tourism sector. We will provide direct financial support to keep the remaining hotels open and to preserve jobs. I commend the sector's resilience during this crisis. We will ensure tourist activities return to normalcy after the pandemic. The newly sworn in tourism minister assured of adequate security despite the recent terrorist attack in the coastal city of Sousse and maintained there have been no cancellations or interruptions reported so far. Our hearts are with the National Guard victim and his family. Yes, we are hit by terrorist attack, but it did not impact tourist activities. Tunisia remains a safe destination which applies strict security and health protocols in accordance with international standards. Tourism experts have expressed optimism that the North African state could attract over 9 million visitors in 2021 if the coronavirus crisis ends this year. This is crucial to the industry that provides 10% of the country's gross domestic product. The objective of the tourism sector is to work 365 days a year without interruption. We must diversify our offers and services to attract more international tourists to the Tunisian destinations in the post-COVID-19 crisis period. Tunisian authorities are promoting alternative and domestic tourism to make up for the losses during the coronavirus crisis. In addition, a short-term action plan is currently being devised to prepare the recovery of the tourism sector. According to recent statistics published by the Central Bank of Tunisia, the country's cumulative tourism revenues fell by 61% to $500 million at the end of August 2020. The current health crisis threatens over 1 million direct and indirect jobs in the tourism sector. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. On to Ethiopia now. Authorities over there have inaugurated a multi-million dollar recreational park in the capital Addis Ababa, which they hope will become a major site for urban tourism. The Chinese-funded Shega Park is part of a 58-kilometer-long riverside beautification project, which showcases Ethiopia's cultural diversity, but also affirms the long-standing friendship between Addis Ababa and Beijing. Here's CGTN's Kirum Chala with the details. The landmark Shega Park is now open to the public, 11 months after works commenced to develop the recreational project. The park comprises cultural centers, an art gallery, and place of science and technology, which mirrors Ethiopia's rich culture and history. Ethiopia is banking on the Friendship Square as a major tourist site. It will also act as a focal point for any event, be it a music festival, meetings, or any other celebration. Now that our capital has got such a magnificent park, which can be used for many events, the city's name and reputation will definitely be elevated. For a very long time, Addis Ababa has been blamed for locking public recreational locations. Now that has changed, and a new start has been ushered in from today. The Chinese government, through the China Communications Construction Company, has funded the project and plans to build a company infrastructure. The venue will feature a recreational space and an artificial lake. 
and a wedding avenue. During the event to mark its opening, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed gave certificates of recognition to Chinese government and other individuals who contributed to the construction of the park. This is a friendship project. It is to further promote the friendship between our two countries, China and Ethiopia, between our two peoples, Chinese and Ethiopians. Some may ask if this will add to the debt burden of Ethiopia. No, it will not. This is a China aid project. And some may ask if China is doing the alleged palace diplomacy. No, this is not a palace, but a public space, a people park. Let me also say that, like all other projects, there is no political strings attached. I love East China. I love Ethiopia. I hope the friendship between our two countries will last forever, and this friendship square could be the best carrier and witness. The opening event of the Friendship Square was marked with an unprecedented military parade alongside other events. The parade showcased the capacity and preparedness for any combat by the country's Republican Guard. The Friendship Square will now become the new highly recognizable landmark of Ethiopia. Under the beautifying Shaga project, Ethiopia is building public parks, recreational centers, and more inside the capital, Addis Ababa. This project of more than 50 kilometers is expected to be completed in few months' time. The initiative aims to give the capital a new and modern look with magnifying its uniqueness to serve its residents and whoever visits. Groomed at Ethiopia. At around 1830 GMT, you're watching Global Business Africa. Time for a break. Here's what's coming up shortly. The UK bags its first trade deal post-Brexit with Japan. And the ECB is pledging once again to use all policy options available to stabilise the bloc's economy. your life at that no. particular time? No, that no. What is your assessment of the state of the continent today? Africa has the potential to pie itself. Excuse me. <laughs> Back to the program. Let's run through some stories making your headlines at this hour, starting in Mali. Constitutional experts over there have put forth their recommendations. Now, the country is on the second day of a series of national consultations on its political transition. The experts are proposing a two year transition period, citing the complexity of the crisis in Mali. Other recommendations include having the ruling junta pick both the interim president and vice president. The recommendations say the appointees can be either a civilian or a soldier. Candidates will have to be, however, between the ages of 35 and 75. The recommendations essentially defy calls by the West African bloc ECOWAS for elections to be held within a year. In South Sudan, residents of Jongle State have been working to prevent their homes and businesses from being swept away 
by floods. Flash floods have displaced nearly 140,000 people so far. Floodwaters from the White Nile have caused misery for residents. Many structures have been swept away. And the remaining ones are also badly weakened. Livelihoods are also quite threatened. In East Africa, Kenya is set to start trials for a COVID-19 vaccine developed by a British company in partnership with Oxford University. Now, the trials will target hundreds of health workers who are on the front line in the battle against COVID-19. The trials are going to be conducted by the Kenya Medical Research Institute, better known as Kemri around here, as well as a range of partners. They will recruit close to 400 health workers along Kenya's coastline for these trials. This makes Kenya only the second country on the continent after South Africa to take part in COVID-19 vaccine trials. And finally, the DRC Nobel Prize laureate Dr. Dennis Mukwege is once again under the protection of the UN. The UN has deployed peacekeepers to protect him following threats to his life. Mukwege started receiving death threats after he called for justice over alleged human rights violations. Now, the UN determined his life was in danger. Mukwege Zemaichi Kohl was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize back in 2018 for his work treating female victims of sexual violence in that conflict. He continues to work in Bukavu in the eastern end of the DRC. That's a run through your headlines. Now, the United Kingdom has secured its first major post-Brexit trade deal after signing an agreement with Japan. Now, the deal is largely a rollover of one that the UK enjoyed as a member of the EU, but it's only been agreed to in principle. It's expected to increase trade between the two countries by roughly $19 billion. UK businesses will also benefit from tariff-free trade on 99% of their exports to Japan. The UK, of course, will no longer be covered by the EU-Japan free trade deal when the post-Brexit transition period expires at the end of this year. That deal removed tariffs on European exports like cheese and wine and reduced barriers to Japanese car imports from 2019. In the meantime, emergency talks have taken place in London between the United Kingdom and representatives of the European Union to discuss proposed changes to the Brexit deal. Overriding parts of the withdrawal agreement would essentially break international law, but UK ministers insist these changes are necessary. Lucy Howe has a view from Brussels. Anger and distrust, a Brexit breach that could derail the talks and prompt a no-deal exit. Brussels is frustrated, but for now, staying at the table in the hope of resolution. As uh, I stated uh, uh, yesterday, I call for extraordinary meeting of the Joint Committee, which is going to take place uh, in a couple of hours. And I came here to express serious uh, concerns the European Union, European Union has uh, over the proposed uh, bill. So that would be the matter of our discussion today. This was the first emergency meeting of the Joint Committee, called as the UK announced plans to override some aspects of the withdrawal agreement. The changes apply to the Northern Ireland Protocol, waiving procedures on the trade of goods from Northern Ireland to Great Britain and restricting state aid rules. They run counter to commitments signed off in October last year as part of the treaty. The EU has said the treaty is a precondition for any future trade deal and has demanded the measures be removed from the internal market bill within the shortest time possible. The UK insisted the changes are limited clarifications but has admitted it intends to break the law. Um, I would say to my um, honourable friend that yes, this does break international law in a very specific and limited way. And there are clear precedents for the UK and indeed other countries needing to consider their international obligations as circumstances change. According to the EU, Britain has already breached the withdrawal agreement by tabling the bill and Brussels is planning legal action that could lead to sanctions. The mood music has shifted and tensions are high. Five weeks to go and no deal in sight. Lucy Hoff, CGTN, Brussels. Now, the president of the European Central Bank says that Europe's recovery from a deep recession is incomplete and uneven. Christine Lagarde has also played down concerns over the recent strength of the euro that has sparked a rally in the common currency. And it stirred questions as to whether the bank will provide a fresh round of stimulus to support the region's stuttering recovery. CGTN's Mark Webster reports from Frankfurt. The president of the European Central Bank's core message throughout this pandemic 
has been that the bank will do whatever it takes to protect Europe's economy from the fallout. Today, she said that asset purchase programmes have proved highly effective, but she didn't rule out a further cut in interest rates if that proved necessary. If and when necessary and warranted by circumstances and in accordance with our mandate, the Governing Council is determined to use all the policy tools that it has available and uh, to uh, deploy them and calibrate them as necessary and as appropriate in order to deliver on our mandate. The ECB said data since July indicated a steady rebound in economic activity. Shoppers are back boosting the domestic economy and a combination of low inflation and ample credit to companies and individuals was stimulating growth. The bank said European interest rates will stay at their present low levels until June next year or until the central bank is confident that the Covid crisis has passed. At the same time, the ECB will continue to pump billions into the economy until there are clear signs that the inflation rate is closer to its target of below but close to 2%. Although this was a largely positive assessment, two things in particular seem to be troubling the European Central Bank. The first is the stubbornly low level of inflation. At 0.4%, it indicates low levels of economic activity. The second is that the euro is climbing against some other major currencies. More expensive eurozone exports means another break on growth. Merci. But Madame Lagarde's constant refrain throughout the press conference was that everything was dependent on how the pandemic played out. And she clearly indicated European economies could yet be in for more turbulence. In the meantime, WeChat pretty much dominates uh, China's instant messaging market, but its parent company Tencent isn't quite satisfied with that. Over the last few months, it has launched a dozen new social messaging apps very quietly trying to exploit new territories. CGTN's so Chen Tong finds out what Tencent is up to. Hood is the latest social app from Tencent, but you almost certainly haven't heard of it. Few people have. Unlike WeChat, which emphasized the instant messaging functions, Hood only allows users to upload pictures of their clothing styles and make friends with people who like them, or at least with the few people who so far have been given the private code to download the app. It's just one of a dozen new projects that Tencent is working on now. Apps not designed for everyone, but for only specific segments of the chatting market. Why is Tencent bothering? It turns out the big player is getting ready to defend its territory. New apps are coming out because mainly app developers are trying to leverage on the trend of 5G. And furthermore, they're showing a more diversified competition strategy against WeChat by focusing on specific niche markets, specific segments in which there are lesser players. At least so far, the niche apps are just an experiment for Tencent because it continues to ride on the immense success of WeChat, which now boasts more than 1.1 billion users. Getting them to change will not be easy. I wouldn't use other apps unless they had very interesting functions. I'd still use WeChat. If my friends used another one, I'd try it. But otherwise, who would I talk to on those apps? The top three social apps that China is spending time on now are WeChat, QQ and Douyin. A Mintiao report says fewer than 1% of people surveyed have not used at least one of those within the past seven days. The experts believe that Tencent's experimental apps actually have the next generation in mind. With so much writing on WeChat now, the company needs to prepare for the possibility that the internet preferences of younger users could change, and they are the key to Tencent's future profits. Tencent is anxious about the young born after 1995, the so-called Generation Z. They are why we have so many different types of e-commerce and social apps with new models and new segments. Tencent has already tasted the sweets of the social community, if WeChat were to lose its popularity, Tencent could quickly come up with an alternative app to hold on to the new generation. 
and Tencent does know about the cost of changing markets. After 10 years of operation, the company has announced it's shutting down its microblogging platform Weibo at the end of this month. Tencent's Weibo had some 300 million active users in 2013, but began to fade away when Xinan Weibo came to dominate in the blogging market. Tencent doesn't want that to happen again. Chen Tong, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. Now then, we covered the business of uh, education in Kenya a little earlier and the decisions that private education service providers about to make over here. So let's cross over across the Atlantic to see what's happening in the United States. State and local officials over there are wrestling with making decisions on social restrictions, business operations, and when and if to reopen schools. They're weighing all kinds of information that's coming through, including something called mobility data. CGTN's Hendrik Sibrandi has the details from Colorado. If there's one constant in America, it's that people are always on the move. Whether it's walking, driving, or some other means of transport, we live in a mobile society. The pandemic tested that proposition when much of life ground to a halt back in March. How immobile did we become? It's challenging because there are a lot of moving parts. Jude Bayham of Colorado State University is a member of Colorado's COVID-19 modeling team. He spent this past spring studying how stay-at-home restrictions affected residents' travel patterns and coronavirus transmission. He used data from people's cell phone apps with location settings switched on. Individual users were not identified. By the time it gets to me, it's been aggregated. So your device is aggregated with hundreds or thousands of others. He found that lockdown orders did indeed cause a dramatic increase in time spent at home. I feel confident saying that, you know, reductions in mobility do uh, relate to reductions in transmission uh, and not necessarily the other way around. It's the kind of information that helps those in charge know whether their social distancing directives are working. And so you make these policies, but you have no idea what the unintended consequences are of them. And so I think it provided some, some feedback to county health officials as to what are things on the ground. Ryan Laher with a COVID-19 mobility network provided three counties with mobility data generated by Facebook, almost like a temperature check. If we provide only to-go orders, how does that look? Okay, if you let people in stores, is that gonna have, a, are, they, are there gonna be huge crowds or does that just have a, an incremental increase? Which is what he found. Mobility data is also part of an algorithm developed by a team at Harvard, which uses Twitter activity and Google searches to try to predict virus outbreaks two weeks in advance. Cell phones already track the movement of people between states. Researchers caution they're still not sure how representative the information is that they're getting. City dwellers act differently than those in the countryside. But as governments become more data driven, mobility data could be an important tool going forward. You're not going to learn everything from mobility data, but I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. There is no capital T truth. Bayham, who also studies the uncertainties of wildfire management, says disease can spread the same way. Data could be an important means of containment. Hendrix Abrandi, CGTN, Denver. As the COVID-19 pandemic does continue to spread around the world, the e-commerce market is one beneficiary. It soared as people staying at home following social distancing protocols. In Brazil, sales volumes on e-commerce have more than doubled as tens of thousands of new merchants have gone online. Our correspondent, Paulo Cabral, has that story on what's hot tonight. In the world of e-commerce, even a small storage box can be a thriving business. It's the case of Oslo, a fashion marketplace that partners with big fashion brands to sell their unsold clothes at discount prices and also helps people to sell their used fashion items. Two years ago, Zoe Povo launched her business and it was doing well. After the coronavirus pandemic hit the country, it boomed. There was a lot of first-time buyers and they could have this e online experience and they saw that it is very nice to have this online experience that they can buy staying at their home. So for us, we have grown more than 300%. There are brands that 50% of their revenue come from Oslo. So we are uh, bringing in a big impact for them. According to the Brazilian Association of E-Commerce, between March and July, business increased by 230 percent, with 135,000 new shops taking their businesses online. 
quarantine and social distancing measures gave a strong boost to e-commerce with well-established online merchants increasing their sales and newcomers embracing a virtual way to reach customers. The challenge now, keeping this extra business regardless of the state of the pandemic. Because convenience is the main reason to use the e-commerce the e alternative. But besides that, uh, the e-commerce alternative is not exactly equal of the store experience. That's why companies are looking for alternatives to add more experience using VR commerce, using live commerce. Principalmente por estar em casa, né? Por ter esse tempo. Being at home, people had more free time to spend in social networks like Instagram and such. And on there, we got lots of publicity from online shops. So sometimes we buy stuff we don't really need and just get it at a good price. There is no question that the pandemic was a severe blow to the world economy. Success stories like the e-commerce boom may be the exception, but can also have long-lasting positive impacts. Paulo Cabral, CGTN, São Paulo. Quick run through commodity prices uh, before we get into the next segment of the bulletin. Let's start with copper. LME forwards uh, for copper, three-month rolling forwards of that uh, in London. They're essentially up for the fifth week in a row. They've been rising pretty consistently uh, since the start of April. They're up nearly 40% from that particular point. Gold up 21% so far this year. And oil, however, is back under $40 a battle. In fact, if it continues this trend, it's set to close about 6.5% lower this week alone. Here's what's coming up next. Cinemas in Nigeria are shutting down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll count the losses next. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. And no one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN. See the difference. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a substantial impact on Nigeria's entertainment industry. Cinemas have been forced to close down in order to curb the spread of the virus. Operators are now struggling to cope with this crisis and they're looking at massive revenue shortfalls that are forcing these businesses to shut down. CGTN's Kelechi Emekalam reviews the impact of the shutdown on the sector in grassroots tonight. Silver Bird, one of Nigeria's biggest entertainment hubs, has remained a shadow of itself for nearly six months now. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, this center played host to nearly 21,000 cinema enthusiasts every week. But dark, dingy cinema halls, empty seats and ticketing stands have taken over the once bubbly arena. And operators are left to deal with the impact of the lockdown. Being shut down means no business. Um, these are our harsh realities, to be, to be sincere. So while we are um, campaigning to reopen, there are real issues such as the rents and the service charge that, and salaries that you have mentioned um, not being changed. Nothing, nothing is being adjusted. The rents are not being adjusted. The service charges are not being adjusted. So uh, while we have told the government that 50% um, attendance will be what we will do when we reopen. The truth is, 100%, it was even a challenge running individually, speaking as an individual business now, running the business, let alone 50% attendance for customers. We movie lovers, I love to go to the cinemas. It's, it's been a very, very tough time. And we just, we do hope that cinema gets to open very soon so that we can go back to our normal lifestyle. Small businesses like gyms, restaurants and kids' centres 
who've leveraged on the cinema traffic are also affected. I think every business in the mall is interwoven. People might come for cinema purpose, but by the time they get to the mall, they see a new business that they will also want to patronize and they will patronize. So because of this interwovenness, the restrictions has really brought down everything because the cinema has not been there anymore. Generally, if the lockdown is lifted, there will be upsurge of business activities. The overwhelming impact of this is that several of these businesses are packing up and closing shop. We've had a lot of businesses that have come to us, you know, and uh, saying they want to shut down. And when we sit down and we discuss with them on why they want to shut down, etc., they explain to us the situation. So those are the places that we can come in and say, okay, you know what, let's do this. Instead of you to pay up front, let's break down your payment for you. I know you can't afford one year rent. Pay it monthly. There's been a tremendous surge in Nigeria cinema culture. According to the Cinema Exhibitors Association of Nigeria, Nigerians spent about $17.32 million on cinema viewing in 2019 alone. That's over 200% increase from the $5.3 million spent in 2018. With the release dates for blockbusters pushed forward, it may be a long road to recovery for cinema operators. However, key players remain optimistic that as government launches the economy, activities would gradually return to normal. Kelechia Mekalam, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. All right, and a quick run through the current season as we wrap up the program. The Kenyan shilling at 108.52. Today, we also did get to see the budget review and outlook paper essentially for the next two fiscal years. Uh, the revenue forecast for this year has been reduced by at least $1 billion and $2 billion cut off for the next one. But deficit financing for this year essentially has now gone up by at least a $1 billion. So you're looking at the domestic market by itself. The government will be looking to borrow something in the order of 554 billion shillings. It's just over $5 billion in this fiscal year. It's a fairly large amount of money. That's where you leave this edition of Global Business Africa. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the content you've seen on the program in the last hour. There are many ways to get your thoughts back to us. All of them are on your screens right now. I'm Raman Yang in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you for your company in the last hour. The World Today is up next from Washington, D.C.